Uh, take your Bibles and join me in Romans chapter 8 as we continue along with our little study that we've been doing in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8, working through the amazing benefits of salvation and what it means for you and I. As a child, I grew up as a preacher's kid, and uh, it's a little bit different, I think, now, but back then, preacher's kids had a, uh, I don't know, a reputation, I guess is the term. It was like, oh, you're a preacher's kid, and I, I tried to live up to that reputation in every possible way, you know, a little bratty, a little unruly, all those types of things, and uh, I will say, having been a preacher's kid, there's a flip side of that. And that is, uh, you're judged a little differently, you're condemned a little differently, and, and you're watched by everybody and everything and so forth. One of the things I think my dad did well, I think it's the one thing, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, one of the things I think my dad did well, you know, just get used to, I'm going to pick at him forever, but I owe him. One of the things, uh, benefits that my dad did really well is he would show us that, you know, yeah, sometimes now and then, it, you know, you get a little of this and that being a preacher's kid, but he would, he, he would recite to us that being a preacher's kid had a lot of benefits, and there were things that happened and things that happened to us that other kids didn't get to have, like we got to sit after church in the pews waiting for him to go home, and you know, no, just, uh, but things that, that happened. We had a pony. I grew up, we had a pony. And it was given to us by somebody at the church. A lot of people didn't have ponies, right? And so we had stuff like that that happened. We, we received fresh vegetables all the time and, and, uh, and so forth. All that kind of stuff. And he would just kind of recite, yeah, there's some, there's some crud, right? And there's some cream. And so we, we got to see that. And he would point out a lot of times, look, don't just look at the crud. Look at the cream. And sometimes it's just important to look at that and stop and, and figure that out. And it's what Romans 8 is. It's talking about the cream of salvation. Now, sometimes, you know, you don't get to do it. You don't get to fulfill the lust of the flesh, which isn't a crud, right? It's a good thing. But sometimes we can look at, you know, uh, but there's a lot of cream to being a Christian. There's amazing benefits. You've, you've gone from being hated by God to being loved. That's pretty good, Right? You've been an enemy to a friend. You've gone from hell to heaven. That's a, that's, do we agree? It's a better bit. So guys came up to me between Sunday school and church. Yeah, you know, we like to give, I ask a question. I'm like, so yeah, you can say yes and you can come back. I'll ask a question now and then, right? You went from hopeless to having hope. That's good, huh? Aimless. You had no real purpose. You just were born and you were living this life with no real aim. Get what you can. And now, now your life has purpose. I think one of the greatest is in our text today. You are a child of God. You are, you are a child of God. Look at verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. This text ties the passage together in a lot of ways, right? So there's no condemnation, and then there's nothing that separates us from God. Why is there no condemnation, and why is there nothing that separates us from God? Ultimately, it's because you're a child of God. Father doesn't condemn his child. Uh, nothing separates you from being a child of God. We are, we are his children. We are, we are brought from death to life. We are established in Christ as, as a new pivot around which all of life revolves. We're established in Christ. And therefore, we are under obligation to Him. Why? We're His sons. We're His daughters. And ultimately, we cannot be separated. What can separate us? Think about it. You are a child of God. And you are unequivocally a child. You are so much a child. The Bible tells us that you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. 
Okay, I'm a child, but somewhere I'm not joint with Jesus Christ, right? I, I, there's, there's the only begotten of the Son. He's the begotten one. We're the adopted one. So there's some level in that, right? That he's the child and we're little c children, right? It's not the way the Bible presents it. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now, don't get too excited about that. You're not part of the Trinity, okay? You're not that. But wow, I'm a family member. And when somebody walks in your house and they're not a family member, you love them, you care about them, and there's familiarity, and you're glad they're there, right? But somebody walks in your house and they're a family member, they kind of act like they belong, right? They open the fridge, right? They, they do some things that are a little bit more familiar because they're family, not because they're a friend. When we get to heaven, we're not, do you mind if I, you just do it, right? We're just family. I walk into mom and dad's house, I plop on the couch. I walk into your house, I gingerly walk, wait for you to sit, ask where I go, which chair is okay. There's a difference between, fee- I'll change the channel. I won't do that at your house, I do it at dad's, right? I have to show him how to use the remote, but. <laughs> but there. There's difference, isn't there, between family and not family? We're not just in heaven. Heaven's ours. We're heirs. It's ours. So there's two, there's actually three clear blessings of being a child of God. I want to talk about those this morning. Three clear blessings about being a child of God. The first one is we are the acceptance of God's sons and daughters. As you and I are being led by the Spirit, the Spirit's indwelling us, we, we move from mere professing believers, right? We're actually believers. We are led by the Spirit because we're indwelled by the Spirit. Professing believers cannot be led by the Spirit because they don't have the Spirit. They don't have it. Professing believers are maybe moral and conscientious and They may be churchgoers, and they may actually read the Bible and do stuff like that, but they live in the flesh. They're doing it in the flesh. Those of us who have actually, by faith, accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we placed our faith and trust in Him. We are being led by the Spirit only because we are indwelled by the Spirit. The Spirit resides in us. And being led by the Spirit is one who sees to some measure a diminishing desire a diminishing doing of the deeds of the flesh. You and I, as believers, being led by the Spirit, not professing, but actual believers, are ones who can have victory over sin. And therefore, we are under obligation to Him, God. Why? We are His sons and daughters, from which we cannot be separated. Now, think about it. Wow. Only God's Spirit can bring about that victory. We are then led by that Spirit. Spirit Spirit-led people are those who do these things. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. We are in Christ. Remember, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, verse 4. Spirit-led person does this. We walk according to the Spirit. So the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to flesh, but we walk according to the Spirit. So we are in Christ, and because we're in Christ, we walk differently. Verse 8, 9, and 11, we've already learned that we are indwelled by the Spirit. However, you who are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ, but... If the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through Christ who dwells in you. Three times He says it. Romans 8 verse 13 says, you put to deed the body, the, the deeds of the body. If you are living in the flesh, you must die. But if the Spirit, but by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will lead live. And so here we have 
the fact that you and I are sons and daughters. We are already there. We are led by the Spirit. We understand that. Now let's answer the question. How does the Spirit lead? How does the Spirit lead? We've talked about that. Eh? Is it a funny feeling? Is it? How does He lead? Or we might ask the question this way. What is the nature of the Spirit's leading? What's the nature of the Spirit's leading? Well, first and foremost, it is constant. It does not come and go. Again, it's not based on feelings. It's constant. It's not just, well, I've got a need now, so what's the Spirit telling me to do? Or there's a danger of temp temptation. It's a present tense, really. It's a constant thing. The nature is continually, if those of you are being led by the Spirit, that's a constant, ongoing being led. Again, present tense. There it is. Number two, it's corrective. It's corrective. The can context is not keeping from harm, but it, the context is that you and I are killing the deeds of the flesh. So constantly, the Spirit is leading me in a present tense way, and He's doing it in a way that you and I are killing the deeds of the flesh. I am being less selfish. I am being more humble. I am being more moral. All those things, I am slowly but do, diligently killing the deeds of the flesh. There is a progression and a consistency of my life and a moving towards a living a more holy, God-pleasing, God-glorifying life by the corrective and constant moving of my heart. Now, Sometimes it's more constant than others, and sometimes I'm making more progression than the other. And part of that being led by the Spirit is, one, being in tune with the Spirit and filling my heart with the Word of God and prayer. Number three, it controls. It's not merely pointing the way, but it's controlling influence that brings us to glory. The Spirit doesn't just go, you need to go that way. But the Spirit walks with us and helps us, and controls us, and keeps us on the path. It navigates life in a much better way than a little blue line on a map. But rather, it navigates life in helping us understand what brings glory to God and takes us ultimately to the glory of heaven. So, what do we understand? Well, we understand that those who are being led are qualified to be sons of God. Because the Spirit indwells me and because I'm being led, that means and is reflective of the fact that I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. I am a child in the family of God. You and I are not hired based upon our ability into God's kingdom. We're not hired based upon our ability to be in God's kingdom. You are not allowed in to God's kingdom based upon your performance. It's a works-based understanding. You and I are sons and daughters of God because of one thing. The result of the work of the Holy Spirit. We were drafted in some sense. In a real sense, the Holy Spirit came and convicted us of our sin. The blinders through the Holy Spirit have come off our eyes. We've recognized our hopelessness and our helplessness situation. We realize a desperate reality, and we cried out to God based upon what His Son, Jesus Christ, did on the cross. The Holy Spirit has led us every step of the way, compelling us. Once God through His Holy Spirit, caused the blinders to fall off our eyes, we could not unsee what we see. And what we saw is our hopeless situation and our sin and the greatness of God and salvation. There was nothing else to do. And you and I are sons and daughters as a result of the work of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit now indwells us, and we're in the family. And only, only an indwelt person 
One who is indwelt by the Spirit can understand this. That's it. So years ago, I, I, well, first of all, let me say this. I like hockey. I don't know if you guys are far enough no, north to really get into hockey here or not. I like hockey. I had a friend in seminary. He was a Canadian. And I told him I really didn't understand hockey. I'd watch it. But, you know, I knew the thing had to go in the thing. Right? And they hit it with sticks. I, I knew that. But I didn't really understand it. So you watch on TV. And hockey's not really a made-for-TV uh, sport. It's really kind of in person. you got to see a lot of stuff that takes place. And so... Uh, at that point, uh, Gretzky had just moved to Los Angeles, and so this Canadian would sit with me in front of a TV and he explained the game. He explained all the three lines and all that kind of stuff and what's going on and changing and all that kind of stuff. I really got, it got into hockey and so really enjoyed it. And, uh, and then my first church was in Los Angeles, and there, some of the Kings hockey fans were there, and they took me to their first game. And uh, uh, took me to my first game as season ticket holder, and I watched a hockey game in person. It was amazing. They won. I was the lucky pastor charm. And so they took me every time they could take me, and uh, let's take the pastor. We win when the pastor's there. And so I got to go to a lot of games. And, uh, and uh, let me just say, I was at the game yesterday uh, in Nebraska, and so I'm never going to actually be able to go again <laughs> to a game. So, uh, sorry about that, my bad. But years ago, I was going back to a conference in Los Angeles. A friend of mine knew I liked hockey. And he said, hey, my neighbor has season tickets to, or has access to tickets to the Kings game. Would you like to go? I said, yeah, I'd love to. So we ended up going to the game. And so we get in the car, we go to the game, we show up, and we walk a mile and a half to the stadium like you have to do. And uh, we walked in there, and he gave me my ticket. And it's in this, like, plastic thing. A little thing goes around your neck. I'm like, ooh. They, you know, season ticket holders didn't want their season tickets messed up, right? So we walk in, and they walk, oh, you guys. And they put us over here, and we went up this fancy elevator. And we went in this plant, and there's nobody walking in the halls. It's all kind of there. And there's people in suits and ties and walking around. And we walk in, and they open a door, and your seats are behind this door. And we walk in, and there's this big, like, Massive living room with a bar and TVs everywhere. And we had box seats. I had never been to a box seat, right? And the only box seat I ever sat in was in third grade in the hall. <laughs> and so we're in these box seats, right? And so uh, we get out there and we walk out. It's, it's center ice, center ice box seats. And what I didn't know is my friend's neighbor worked for Toyota. And Toyota had box seats. And so they gave us these seats. And it seated 20 people, but it was just the two of us. And they bring in this buffet card, and we have all this food. And then about halfway through, they bring in the dessert cart. And it's like, this is incredible. Look at the, I need to work for Toyota. Don't they need a pastor? <laughs> and it turns out they don't. <laughs> I was in the best seats of the house because I had a friend and because my friend had a friend, and because my friend's friend worked for a company who had some money, blah, 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 right? And so the friend of my friend's company paid the price. I am in heaven, not because of what I've done or who I am or based upon my ability, but because God decided he wanted to be my father I had nothing to do with those box seats. I was a place I did not belong, but I belong. It's not a friend of a friend. It's not somebody else paid for anything. My dad owns this. My dad owns this. He owns my heart. And he owns my eternity. And it's mine too. That God should let you into his heaven. That's what we use. We use that phrase a lot of times when we're sharing the gospel. If you're going to stand before Christ and God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? You know what the phrase is now? Come to our heaven. That's kind of weird to say. Sometimes we just don't think we ultimately belong, but we get in anywhere by the hair of our chinny chin chin. No, we are there because it's ours. 
Our family owns that. Jesus is there preparing a place for you, not because you need some apartment to live in in his big city. He's there preparing a place for you because you are his brother and he is your brother and the Father himself wants you to have a bedroom. And just like a kid at college who can't wait to go home and be home and sleep in his own bed, heaven is that for you and me. Why? Because we're being led by the Spirit of God and we are the sons and daughters of God. When Jesus tells us, and the Holy Spirit writes in his word, that heaven is not your home, he means this. Heaven is not your home. Now, it might be the only home you've ever known, but it's not your home. We put roots so deep. We shouldn't have roots. We're potted plants, guys. We're sons and daughters. What's the advantage to being God's sons and daughter? Well, how much time do you have? Right? First of all, the advantage of being sons and daughters is it's a blessing of freedom. We're free from slavery and fear. Look at verse 15. For you have not been re- received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You received a f- spirit of Adoption, blessed freedom, living in the flesh, sin in this world, living to fear for the one who continually is under the judgment of God. When when one is a slave to sin, he is also a slave to God. I was a couple months ago driving to Idaho with my friend, and we were just talking about Things He became a believer later in life. He says, one of the great things I see about being a believer, he says, before I got saved, I was always scared to die. Man, I was scared to die. You know, I, I just didn't want to get sick. I didn't want to die. I was scared to die. Now he says, I, I don't have a death wish, but I don't fear it. I don't, I don't, I, I'm just not afraid of it. I, I, I live differently past the Oreos. Right? We can... I, I, 1 John 4, 18 says, there is no fear in love. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment. The one is fear is not protected in love. What, what does fear have? Fear has the idea of punishment. Why do I not want to die? Because whether they know anything about hell or not or judgment of God or not, they understand fear, death is not good, and it going to pay. There's a sense in which everybody's got to pay for what they've done with their life. Hebrews 2, 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also took partook of the same. That through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who fear of death, who are subject to slavery all their lives. Being a child and a son and a daughter of God means that you and I have not received a spirit of slavery. If you're not a child of God, you are under slavery of sin and the devil all your life. We're free. We're free. We're Americans, right? Freedom's a big deal to us. And we don't want any of our freedoms eroded, attacked, taken away, speech, guns, religion, Those are things that somebody wrote down in some piece of paper a long time ago. We hold to those things. There are so many brothers and sisters in Christ that have none of those things, but they are freer than we are in our country because they're free from death and sin. But not just the freedom. That's the blessing, but it's equally the blessing of adoption. Now, the Hebrews did not, as far as we understand, 
have a legal aspect of adoption. I kind of had clans, family clans, and the family clans absorbed those things and had responsibilities to do that. They did not necessarily have a legal aspect of adoption. The Romans did. Now, the Romans' legal aspect of adoption what was a, a little different than we might understand in the United States. It was male only. You could only adopt a boy. And it was not so much to be philanthropic. They weren't going to do this boy a favor. And they, they loved this kid. Oh, the precious little baby. And I'm going to adopt him, raise him. They did it more of an egocentric way. The reason I would adopt a child legally, not that I wouldn't necessarily bring a child in my home because I cared for a child, but if I were to legally adopt a child, the reason I'd do that was egocentric. It was given for the kind of the, the, the middle to upper class people who would adopt a child so that their status or their social privileges would carry on. I would adopt a child. Why? Because I wanted my posterity to continue not because I cared and loved this child. It was, it was more an egocentric thing. Now, what we do know is there's some hints at or some examples in the Old Testament. Uh, Exodus would be one, right? Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Obviously an act of God. And so you have Moses in the middle of the killing of the male children. Uh, Moses' mother put him in the bulrushes. Miriam oversaw that. The, the, Pharaoh's daughter came out there, had pity on this child, and she adopted Moses. And Moses went into Pharaoh's house. Moses had all the privileges that any other royal child would have. He wasn't necessarily going to be the next Pharaoh, but he had royal privileges. And he was adopted by that. Another kind of sort of situation, if you will, was Esther was adopted by Mordecai. Okay, and so we understand there's a cousin, a family relationship there. We understand that very much in our day and age. Many times when a child is, is left in a situation where parents weren't there or parents are unfit, a lot of our own children's services will look to grandmas and grandpas, cousin, aunts, uncles to raise that child. They'll look there first. And so as Esther's mom and dad, whatever happened to them, Mordecai took Esther in and adopted. It's another situation we have, and he cared for her like he would his own child. Uh, another one would, would be Hannah. Hannah prayed for and wanted a child so much, and God graciously answered this woman so distraught, they thought she was drunk. Gave to Hannah Samuel, and Hannah went and turned Samuel over after at least Samuel was weaned. And Eli adopted him in, and he was raised by Eli. There's a couple of examples we have of adoption and understanding that. No doubt, Paul borrows, I think, from the legal idea here. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 5, he says, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And it was understood, that's what took place. Somebody would take a child in, in a Roman situation, they would take a male child in. That male child then would have all the rights and privileges of a legal heir. The immeasurable blessing of adoption is seen in a most personal way. So, on the one hand, there's the legal. I have the rights, the privileges, I have the name. It is my family. I have all the heir, uh, heir you know, I'm not saying error. It sounds to me in my own head like I'm saying error. Error. You know something? It sounds weird to me. I'm not A-I-A-R. I'm not E-R-R. -R -R okay. Sounds funny in my head. Hair. How do I say it right? Okay. All right. He or R A. Anyway. I have everything. Everything. Full family rights and privileges. It's more than that. It's the immeasurable blessing of the adoption, yes, on the one hand, but it is equally the most personal way. The most personal way. In such a way that we cry out, Abba, Father. We cried out, Abba, Father. As a result of our adoption, we are compelled to cry out in the most intimate way. Adoptions are not always easy. 
Adoptions are not always easy. You talk to families that have adopted and talk to adoption agencies, there's a real challenge. It's not natural. These children have a natural mom and dad, and naturally, somehow, I don't know how it all works, they feel that. I know many a child, even as adults, who are adopted and they have natural mom and dad questions. What happened? Why? What's taking place? It's not natural. I have a friend, one of our staff members in Birmingham, and he and his wife decided they were going to adopt a a child, and they had it all figured out, and through the process it changed a little bit, but they went to Hungary, and they stayed there for a little over a month, and they found this young boy, and well, it was all planned out, but they didn't just go find a young boy, but it was all planned out. And, and they went there, and they visited a few times, and then they had to stay there for 30 days, and a child lived with them, and so forth, and all that took place, and the child was taken out of an orphanage, or a, a home that it had been raised in for three or four years. It was the only life that child knew. And they pulled that child out of that. This child's in a new situation. They don't really even speak the same language. There's challenges. They come home. They're excited. They're going to rescue this child. They, and it's been a challenge. That child has needs they didn't realize that that child was going to have. That child's got things going on. It, it, it wasn't this romantic idea of we're going to go save you and you're going to love us and we're going to, it was, it's been a challenge. And that's, a, that's an all too familiar story. It's an all too familiar story. There is a, a process of relationship. You guys know my story, familiar with my mom and dad and nine years old, I got a new mom. At some point they decided that Something happened to dad, they needed to secure the rest of his kids, and so there needed to be an adoption take place. And I sat down, explained the why of the need for adoption. Fine, great, that's wonderful, nothing's going to change, whatever. But even though somebody writes something on a piece of paper, the relationship has to grow. That's just the nature of it, right? Just like my friend, any adoption that takes place, the, the relationship has to go. Now, if you adopt somebody at a day old, that's different than if you are, uh, but there's a relationship that has to grow. So notice what it says in the text. Look at the text. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. It's not just that there's a static legal, you are now legally a son. True, absolutely. Amen and amen. We are legally sons and daughters of God. Legally, heaven is ours. We are heirs of Christ, but... It needs to be more than that. There's a relationship that we cry out, Abba, Father. Over the years, I've watched this family in Birmingham, and slowly but surely, through many tears and all the above, this relationship has been growing. Ways to go, right? As with every adoption, a relationship grows. But the point of the relationship is not just that you and I are heirs of heaven legally, but ultimately there is a desire for a relationship. Abba. It's just the simplest term of a child's first utterance. Papa, dada, right? Every dad is in competition for them to say dada before mama, right? But either dada or mama, it is the simplest and most endearing child's first utterance to the person who's closest and most dearest to them. And God is wanting you to cry out to him, Abba, because he wants you to be the most closest and dearest to you. Why? Because he sent his only begotten son so that he might pay the price of adoption to bring you into his family, not just that you might have legal status in an egocentric way, but that he would love you and that you would love him. Abba is, in a sense, a most informal Aramaic term. It's, It's a term that means intimacy and tenderness and dependence and trust and and love. And that intimacy and tenderness and dependence and trust and love is seen in the most demonstrative way. 
God gives you a piece of himself and he places in your heart. It's the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus in Gethsemane in Mark 14, verse 36, and he was saying, Abba, Father. All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not I what I want, but you what you will. <laughs> Jesus himself is the one who prays this tender, intimate way. The highest title you could ever have is ultimately with the dearest title you could ever have, and that is a child of God. There's no greater position to which you could ever rise in all of this universe that you are an heir and owner of heaven. And at the same time, it is equally mo the most intimate and dearest title you could have. Our response is the privilege only a son has, and that is to call the Almighty God Abba, Father. Now, there's a lot of guys in here that are very close to each other, but you're not going up to your friend and going, hey, Dad, hey, Daddy. No, that's, that's reserved only for that intimate father-son, that ultimate daughter-son relationship. It's an intimate term. It's a reserved term. You don't go around throwing that around to anybody. In fact, the sad thing is that some of you don't have a relationship with your father in such a way that you could use that term with your earthly father. I'm sorry. I wish you could. But not a replacement, but even better is that you have that with your heavenly Father. The book of Exodus, we see this great God who's the burning bush God, who's the plagues God, who's the split the Red Sea God, who's the conquer the army God, who's to bring the water out of a rock God, the Redeemer, who demands that they follow the law and come to the tabernacle and meet Him once a year and bring their sacrifice God at the same time. He is the God who protects and provides and cares and loves and makes sure that every day they got something to eat and He takes care of them, God. The great the mighty shake the mountain and they'll bring you water and manna and care for you. Abba. It is my prayer for myself and for you that your relationship with God is as a son and a daughter. He's not some abstract idea. But he is the one who resides in your life and who you plead with. And that your prayers are not some sort of formulamatic thing that you think a Christian should say, but your prayers are there pleading with and your Abba and you're caring for. Your prayer life is genuine that way. It's beyond conversational. But they're intimate and deep, soul-bearing and caring. The third thing that we understand is the assurance of God's sons and daughter. Is this really true? Verse 16. Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Yeah, it's true. It's pinch me stuff, right? Am I awake? Is this true? How can it be so? I, I don't know. Every time I go through this, I, it's, bad. it's true because God's word says it's true, right? I don't deny that, but wow, it is. And God leaves us with a witness he wants you to know it's true. And how does he? He leaves his own spirit. He leaves a piece of you inside you. Paul does not have in mind some mystical voice or some feeling in your brain or in your gut or in your heart. Rather, it is the testifying of the Holy Spirit. How do I know the Holy Spirit's at work with me? Verse 13, I'm dying to my flesh. I'm living in the Spirit. How do I know it's true? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Three things are what? I'm not only just denying to my flesh, but slowly but surely I, I am seeing love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those things are slowly growing in me. Do you doubt your sonship or your being a daughter today? Do you doubt that? 
1 John 3 says this, little children, let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. How we know that this, that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him and whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart, knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. What's going on there? Well, First John is this he just sets a standard in First John like, I, I'm sorry, I can't get there. If you don't love your neighbor as yourself, you're not saved. Have you met my neighbor? As myself? I love him. He's a great guy, but as myself? I don't even love him like family, let alone myself. That's a standard. Right? Anybody who... who, who Violates the law in one. Well, did you follow me around yesterday? That's just an impossible. And so he's writing this incredible standard, and he gets to First John three. And says, okay, wait, wait, wait. It's okay. Take a deep breath. I know. Well, everybody I'm writing to right now feels like they they're not saved, and they never could be saved. Whatever your heart condemns you, God's bigger than your heart. God's bigger than your heart. The reality is you are a son and a daughter. And the reality is he does love you. And the reality is he has given you his Holy Spirit. And the reality is he can give you victory. And it's a process. So if your heart condemns you, have a conscience of God. Just because my feeling in my heart is there's no way I can be saved doesn't mean I'm not have my confidence in God. What's my confidence in God? God said he sent his son. God said they would die on the cross. God, right? All those things. Those are the truths of God. And so I go back to the truths of God and I rehearse the truths of God. And the truths of God are true. So how I feel is not true. My confidence is what God and what He has said, not how I've said. I'm in process. Amen? I'm in process. I'm not there. I'm working on it. My heart will condemn me, but it doesn't change the fact that God's salvation and those truths are there. As a result of those truths, as a result of my faith, I am his son and I am his daughter. So I have assurance. Wow. Let's ponder this. The cost is this. The cost for you to be adopted. I, I hear cost today of adoption like twenty to $40,000 like, holy smokes. I remember some friends, and they're like, man, I, you know, well, we'd buy a new car. I'm like, okay, you never mind that, right? <laughs> the cost is the death of Christ. The cost for you to be a son or daughter of Jesus Christ was the fact that he gave his own son. I might consider adoption. Would I give up another kid to be adopted? Oh, he sent his own son, the sacrifice of his begotten son, so that he could have adopted children. He doesn't just save us. He adopts us. He doesn't just adopt us. He wants us to be his, his Abba children. He wants us to be his dear children. And he wants you to be assured of the fact that you are his. His infinite, tender love goes beyond just a static salvation, but it's an adoption so that you can be assured of that status forever. He doesn't want you to fear not being in the child of God. You know, if I go to Thanksgiving and I say this or do what I really think, my mom will never forgive me for the rest of my life. That ain't happening with God. If I do this, my dad won't talk to me. Never happen with God. Never happen. First John 3, verse 1. See how great the love of the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. 
How great is the love of the Father? The great of the love of the Father is that you and I would be called children of God. And all the attending truths with regard to that. They sent his own son. They sent, you know, all that true. And such we are. We gather together as people who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? We recognize our sin. We know we can't do it ourselves. We know we are dependent upon the Jesus Christ to come and die for us, the sending of the Father. We are dependent upon Him. The perfect sacrifice for imperfect, sinful, despicable enemies of God so that one day the Holy Spirit would open our eyes and you and I, by the gift of faith, place our faith in Jesus Christ. Not just that we'd have faith in Jesus Christ's gift, but that we would be enveloped in the arms of God and we'd be brought to His bosom and we would call Him Abba. I love a high view of God. But that high view of God should never distract from the fact that He stoops low and picks up His children and loves them so tenderly. He's not just the God who shakes the mountain. He's the God who cares and loves his children. Yes and yes. This morning we have the privilege to remember the sacrifice that brought us into the family of God. I'm going to ask the men to come forward at this time. Look forward. Our time around the Lord's table. It is an amazing.